and welcome to Green Iowa AmeriCorps. This video will be specifically for the energy and community team, but anyone can learn from it. It will be your how to audit training video from beginning to end. Hope you enjoy. When emailing your audit client for scheduling, you can subject line the email with schedule home energy audit you could add with Green Iowa AmeriCorps so they remember. Greet them by name and then you can start with being specific about how you met or if they signed up via the audit log, you can thank them for showing their interest. So here's an example of a script for an email. Thank you for signing up for a home energy audit with Green Iowa AmeriCorps. The process usually takes about two hours but maybe more or less depending on the needs of the home. Some upcoming availability includes, then name some specific days, times, and then you can mention like the following week is also flexible or available. Then what I also do is I say, please reply all and feel free to suggest other times if they don't work for you. Because I CC carbon copy my teammates who join the audit. So I want the client to reply all so we're on the same page. Next, you can ask some specific questions to be prepared. Is your attic easily accessible or should we bring a tall or short ladder? Do you have any specific comfort concerns with your home that you'd like us to know about so we can keep that in mind when packing materials? And then this last part is specific to if you're near the end of your term and don't know when the next team will start. I mention that by saying, our team would be happy to get you on our schedule this month or September as our service terms end in September. If we cannot get you scheduled by then, you will be put on a waiting list for the next incoming team. Looking forward to it. And then for my email signature, I add my name, pronouns, our position name, with Green Iowa, our specific office phone number, and a mention for the free energy saver services, which are the energy saver kits, and the link for the home energy audit for them to bring, um, that will bring them to the sign up form. So you just got off the phone or just confirmed via email with your audit client. So it's now time to schedule it officially in your team calendar. We use Google Calendar, so here's a look on my phone of it. For example, if we schedule it at 10 a.m., make a four-hour time block just to be safe, especially in the beginning. You might be slow at doing audits, but when you get more familiar with it, it'll go by quicker, and especially if you have more teammates helping you. Set a 30-minute audit prep time before the audit so you have enough time to go from your storage building pack to the car and drive to the audit this may take longer if the audit is farther away when you go to schedule the audits i name it audit client name and i make reference to the number that they are listed on the weatherization log so that we keep track with updating it after the audit Make sure you post their address in it, and then in the notes description below, make sure you write their phone number, email, the comfort concerns that they mentioned to you so that you can keep that in mind when packing materials. And if you need to bring a short or tall ladder, mark that also if their attic is not accessible easily. The day before the audit, make a reminder to send your client a email or a quick call. If they request for you to remind them earlier, just set it more days in advance early to remind them. Make sure you mention their name and number in the reminder as well. And tell them to not turn on their fireplace 24 hours in advance. If it's summer, that's not usually applicable, but if it's the colder times, make sure that they don't use their fireplace. This is where we lay out all of our audit supplies as we pack for audit prep. On the table are things that we use very often, and then under the table is backstock and extras. 
depending on your city, host site, your storage room, it's going to look different. I just encourage you to keep it organized so you know everything that you have at your disposal and then let your supervisor know when certain items are getting low so that they can be restocked. No matter the results of the blower door test, you can always do direct install measures. Some examples are, for our host site, we leave up to 12 LED bulbs for the client. So this is what a box of 12 would look like. You can always insulate water heater pipes there's different types. This is the aluminum foil tape kind or the foam rods. You can wrap around the pipes to insulate like that. You can do aerators. This is a kitchen sink example. As long as the size is compatible with the faucets that they have. This one pulls out to make a spray and then a single stream. There's also regular sink faucet ones or the shower heads have different power settings, you can show that and tell them that it cuts down 50% of their water usage because it pumps out air and water at the same time, but it does not compromise on the pressure of the water. You could also provide furnace filters if your host site has provided those for you. We have a few different sizes depending on what their size is. Just ask or bring one of each if you forgot to ask ahead of time. And this is a filter whistle, which you clip with the furnace filter right between it. Clip it on, and then when it needs to be changed, it makes a high-pitched whistle. Sometimes people like that as a reminder if they're not on a regular schedule of, of swapping them out. We also just happen to have some replacement covers. Things like this that do not seal the house any tighter, you can always do. These are our dedicated audit totes that we put all of our materials in. I have labeled here that this one is dedicated for weather strips and gloves that we put on for spray foam or caulking and then sealant tape for insulating water heater pipes. So this is the pack of gloves we just leave in here for when we need them weather stripping of all different widths and sizes here, and then the different kinds of tape that we might need for insulation. Below that is a smaller tote that we have labeled that's dedicated for any unfinished or already opened weather stripping so that we make sure to use that first before we keep opening more packages so it doesn't get too messy. The other audit tote here is labeled for mostly baker rod, AC covers and foam, and inside are two other smaller totes. So in the first smaller tote, this one's dedicated for aerators for sinks, kitchens, faucets, and showers. There's also some furnace filters in there. Since they're small packaged items, we keep them com contained in here so they don't get lost in the bigger totes. The other smaller totes, is for outlet covers, insulators, and then the plastic plug covers and rope caulk. Since they're smaller packaging that we open and use part of often, we want to make sure it all stays contained here. Since there's outlet themed items in here, you can also put replacement covers and little screws in here too. Other audit equipment that we have is the blower door fan. This is for the safety checks with our gas and carbon monoxide reader. And then in here is the red fabric canvas and the technology equipment and the red and green tubing that we need for the blower door. This is our tool bucket with this separate attached space so that two audit coordinators can grab some materials and go their separate ways during the audit and get it done more efficient. So safety glasses, in here you can put flashlights, pens if you need it to write down the audit summary report, and little screws or heads that you need for the tools. Line things are on the outside, and on the inside make sure to take out any used materials and dispose of them properly so you don't lose any tiny things in here.
So this is the gas meter. So this is going to just be testing if there's any gas leak. We use this device here. And so on the outside of each house, you have a meter just like this. And you use this instrument to test. And so you really want to focus on the elbows of this meter. Because if there is a gas leak, it's going to be on the elbow. And so gas rises. So you really want to focus on the tops of it, especially. So you just want to be as close as you can and just go back and forth and then go focus on the other elbows here. And this meter beeps, and so it'll beep slowly if there's a very low detection, but then it starts beeping faster and faster if there is any gas leak detected. So you'll be able to hear the beeping get faster if there's an issue. But if you hear the beeping consistently slow, that means there's no gas leak, and that means that you are good to go and proceed on with your safety check. So this is the second part of our safety check. So in the basement of most houses, you're going to find the hot water heater and the furnace. And so a lot of the hot water heaters and furnace are gas powered. And if it is gas powered, then you have to check and make sure there's no gas leak. So this particular hot water heater is gas and you know that it is because you have this hood here. And so that allows the gas to come up and not come out, basically the hood juts out to collect all the gas. And so we know this is a gas water heater, so we're gonna test it and make sure there's no gas leaks. So this line's just for the cold water, this is for the hot water, but this is actually the gas line. So we wanna focus on this especially. And just like with the outside, we want to focus on the elbows. So first that starts down here, you see some elbows down here near where the pilot light is, which we'll talk about a little later. And so you just want to go around it and especially on top because again, gas rises. So you want to focus on the areas just above the elbow and then you focus on this one. Again, you're just waiting to hear if the uh, sensor beeps louder. You can see it better now that we're indoors. This sensor will go all the way up to five if there's a significant issue with gas. This is a two. Two really doesn't indicate too much of an issue. Um, once you get above a three is really when you need to start paying attention for any gas leak. But now we can reach up here and test this elbow. And again, you want to test it above because of the gas rising and not really getting any significant readings, so that's good news. Just do that a few times, make sure there's no issue. Um, sometimes what you'll have happen here in the basement is you'll run into spider webs. And so spider webs can actually make the sensor falsely detect. And so you wanna make sure that there's no spider webs getting in the way because that'll sometimes cause the sensor to beep really fast and think that there's an issue. So just make sure that you check for spider webs in that situation. And so you're just gonna run all the way down and you're gonna stop at any area that's an elbow. So we'll run all the way down here and then finally an elbow here. So we'll stop and we'll check that. And so that's your hot water heater. The furnace is very similar. This is a gas furnace as most furnaces are. So again, with the elbows here, we're just gonna check we're gonna make sure that there's no high readings here. We see there's still a two, so that's not too much of an issue. It stayed consistent. There's no rise in the numbers, and so feel pretty comfortable at this point, but we just wanna make sure there's no issues. And while we're in the basement, we also want to check the ambient. And so this is the carbon monoxide meter. And so we just wanna go around the house checking this and making sure the carbon monoxide stays very close to zero parts per million. Uh, very often we'll get a reading of zero. If you get much higher than zero, then that would be an issue. But as long as it stays uh, at or around zero, that would be a acceptable measure for your uh, safety checks. And so if you have no high gas readings and no high carbon monoxide readings, then you can proceed on with your safety check. While we're down here in the basement, we'll also keep in mind the furnace filter size, which is usually in the little crevice here, and the measurement reading is down here. If your host site has replacements for them, you can give them to the clients and ask your audit client if they'd like a replacement. You're going to be calculating the volume of the houses you work in. 
in order to run the blower door test. That will give you the ACH scores and the other measurements we use to determine how much leakage is going on in the home. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get the height of the rooms in the home. Uh, normally, per floor, it's the same height. That's not always the case, but you just wanna measure the height. Once you have the height, you can measure the volume of the room by multiplying it by the width and the length of the rooms. Sometimes you'll measure those by hand, but a lot of times you can just use acon.schneidercorp.com. They have a Dubuque County, Iowa section. From there, you can actually search the addresses of the homes that you're working in. Now it's time to check for the insulation that's in the attic. Every home is different. So what we're looking for here is that there's no vermiculite present so that if there is, it would need to be tested for asbestos contamination. Let's see what's inside. All right, so this is the interior of this attic space. This looks to be blown in cellulose. It is hard to measure by sight, but I'm looking at about maybe eight inches of it. Now that we've gone through most of the safety checks, we move on to worst case testing, which is the final step of our safety checks for the home to pass. This is the page on Qualtrics during the intake questions where you will write if the devices passed worst case conditions with the yes or no option. When doing worst case condition safety checks, this includes turning on all exhaust fans which are usually located in bathrooms. If there's a range hood that vents to the outside over the stove, you can turn that on. If the homeowner has a closed dryer, you can turn that on to an air fluff setting. And then on the thermostat, turn it to system off and fan on. All right, so here we see the canvas and the blower door being set up. And so you want to make sure that when you set up the blower door, you tighten the knob first. You want to tighten the knob and then you want to tighten the lever. If you do it backwards, it can cause the blower door canvas to get off track and it'll actually cause it to not be able to tighten and you'll have to fix it. So it's really important to do knob first, then lever. And then at the end of the process, when you're taking it down, you want to put the lever back up into this position and then loosen the knob. So it's important to follow that process. The other thing about the cords, this green cord is going to go to the outside. You want to make sure that the green cord on the outside is not in front of the blower door. If it's in front of the blower door, then oftentimes the computer will give us a reading that there's too much pressure and there's too much fluctuation and then we'll have to adjust where the green cord is and that's difficult when it's outside and the blower door is up. So you want to make sure that the green cord is protected, maybe in a mailbox or in a, some sort of box or shoe even on the outside of the house. You just want to make sure that the green cord is not in front of the blower door and not exposed to the elements and the wind outside of the house. Then where you plug in the cords inside is green, grass, outside, A, and the red cord is B for blood, and you want to put them on the middle bracket here. So everyone, this is what happens and what you need to do when you forget to put the green cord outside before you put up the frame in the door. Pro tips for putting in the blower door fan is start from the bottom, tilting it on the canvas here so it doesn't get folded over and then pull around the top and make sure that it fits over these bolts right here, not behind it. Pull it over the top so it's fully covered and no air seeps through. And then if you come look here in these notches, we put it about two above where this is sitting. One, two is where we put the crossbar. At this point, we've concluded the blower door test, and so we're back down here with the hot water heater in the furnace, and I just wanted to talk about a few things that we do uh, at the end of our test. So firstly, we want to note that the pipes to the hot water heater are insulated. 
It's really important to have the first few feet of piping into the hot water heater fully insulated because that'll keep uh, the pipes from freezing and also keeps it hot air for the client. We want to make sure that the water is um, hot and comfortable. So that's the first thing to note. So that is good to go. The second thing here is if you look down at the hot water heater, because it's a gas water heater, we have put it on pilot. So this is something that you'll be prompted to do when the blower door test is about to start. Uh, the setting was originally on and then we put it on pilot. You can tell by this little notch here, that's where the uh, that's supposed to line up. So basically at the end of the test, we want to put it back on the original setting. And so put it back on and that lines up with on. And so we are good to go down here. Here's our team unpacking our audit supplies and blower door equipment from our audit. It's important to bring in your materials after an audit in order to restock materials that you used and dispose of any used items. The other blower door equipment that's important to take in is weather sensitive items. The blower door equipment is expensive and if it gets really hot or if you're in temperatures where it's really cold overnight, you don't want to leave it in a car at that time. These are some materials you can leave in your car if you have the space, such as air filters as long as they won't get smashed and then the frame for the blower door because it's not weather sensitive if the weather changes to freezing or hot, unlike the blower door equipment that's sensitive. You did it! You finished an audit. Now it's time to upload the Qualtrics survey and update the weatherization log with the results from today. And now you can schedule your next audit.